Well, I'm sure that you've met women in your life that, that, that acted towards you in a bullying and detestable manner. It's very difficult for women to cope with that because they don't have any real recourse. And female bullying can be unbelievably vicious. And usually that takes the place of, takes the shape of reputation destruction, innuendo and gossip. It's well documented. It's very Only difficult women, to defend. But no, men do it too, but men, no. But oh, sorry, the patterns, disproportionately women, in any of you or not. Sorry. Yes, when yes, disproportionately women. That's what the data indicate. I mean, if men Where are. Where is the if, data on innuendo and if, gossip? Well, it's among antisocial behaviour among adolescents. It's a well documented field. And just to be clear, that you think that's predominantly a female modus operandi? It isn't that I think that. Well, I'm it's that the you. clinical literature indicates that. Psychologist Janet Lever spent a whole year at elementary school playgrounds watching girls and boys play. Boys fight a lot, she noticed, about 20 times as often as girls do. To her surprise, though, she found that boys who fight each other usually end up being better friends after the fight. They are more likely to play together in the days after the fight than they were in the days before. Girls seldom fight, but when they do, often with words rather than fists, the bad feelings last. Psychologists Louise and David Perry interviewed girls and boys, average age 10 years, asking them how they might respond to certain situations. For example, they asked the children, suppose you're playing soccer with your friends and some other kid comes and grabs the ball from you. Violence often pops up in, in your work as something you think drives things. That you, I think you've said in relations between men are more are regulated by a background threat of force and in oh, a sense that's that's absolutely. why men have difficulty with women is that really no sad? that's why men have difficulty with women who are completely out of control but who women should, who have should control women well other women themselves men society just like everyone is controlled i mean you're controlled by society i'm controlled by society and thank god for that i mean it's part of funny i mean you, you described yourself as a liberal earlier and i think a liberal doesn't think that a society controls women or men well let's say regulates I'm a psychologist as well. But I mean, what is an out-of-control woman? What is this creature? How do we know when we met one? Well, I'm sure that you've met women in your life that, that, that acted towards you in a bullying and detestable manner. It's very difficult for women to cope with that because they don't have any real recourse. And female bullying can be unbelievably vicious. And usually that takes the place of, takes the shape of reputation destruction, innuendo and gossip. It's well documented. It's o very difficult women, to defend. But no, men do it too, but men... No, but oh, sorry, the patterns... disproportionately women, in any of you or not. Sorry. Yes, when yes, disproportionately women. That's what the data indicate. I mean, if men Where are. Where is the if, data on innuendo and if, gossip? Well, it's among antisocial behavior among adolescents. It's a well documented field. So, because people look at aggressive and antisocial behavior in women and in men. And in women, it tends to take the expression of innuendo, gossip, and reputation destruction. And in men, it take, tends to take the form of outright physical aggression. There's a whole literature on that. It's, it's not a surprise to anyone. This has been known for, for, for 30 years. I mean, the rates of antisocial... I think the idea of the female gossip probably predates 30 well, years. Well, it does, it does. By a long does. time, but that doesn't, it is, no, but, doesn't make it gospel, but really, people does it? Have, no, it doesn't, but people have looked at how women express... Look, women have to express aggression somehow unless you're willing to say that they're not aggressive. They tend not to do it physically, not to the degree men do, so they use other channels. And what other channels are there other than physical aggression if you're going to be aggressive? Well, you go after people verbally. You go after them with innuendo and gossip and reputation destruction. And that's how it, that's how it works. And just to be clear, that you think that's predominantly a female modus operandi? It isn't that I think that. Well, it's that the you. clinical literature indicates that. It isn't that I think it. Well, I'm not interviewing the clinical literature. I'm interviewing you. What do you well, think? Well, I'm a psychologist and a scientist, and I, tend to, and I tend to base my opinions on what I've read in the broad, relevant clinical literature. I'm not making this stuff up. I studied antisocial behavior for like 15 years. I'm actually quite an expert on it. And so th we know that men are more likely to... Look, look, look at it this way. All right. Women are much more likely to try to commit suicide. And men are much more likely to kill themselves. And the reason for that is that men use lethal force and women don't. Now, that's a big difference. Okay, so then you say, well, women manifest aggression towards themselves and to others, but they don't use lethal force. They don't use physical force the same way men do. So they have to do it some other way. Why do well, they have the other to ways? do something some other way? That, you know, because you people are aggressive. You can take your Hobbesian war against... You know, so you're basically a Hobbesian. Like, uh, no, war I'm half, of all and against half, war. half and half. Half Hobbes, half Rousseau. That's why I'm not an ideologue. 
because I don't think that people are good or evil. I think they're both. I don't think that culture is security or tyranny. I think it's both. And I don't think that nature is benevolence or catastrophe. I think it's both. And that's why I'm not an ideologue. Lessons from the Playground Ever watch kids playing on a playground? Psychologist Janet Lever spent a whole year at elementary school playgrounds watching girls and boys play. Boys fight a lot, she noticed, about 20 times as often as girls do. To her surprise, though, she found that boys who fight each other usually end up being better friends after the fight. They are more likely to play together in the days after the fight than they were in the days before. Girls seldom fight, but when they do, often with words rather than fists, the bad feelings last. I hate you. I'm never, ever, ever going to play with you again, Katie says to Amy, and the older she is, the more likely that she will be true to her word. After a big fight between Katie and Amy, Amy's group may not play with Katie's group again for the rest of the school year. Lever's reports are similar to what scientists have found with chimpanzees. Male chimpanzees are about 20 times as likely to fight as females are, but the fights don't last more than a few minutes and rarely result in major injury. Two male chimps who fight each other this morning may be grooming each other this afternoon. According to Franz de Waal, a primatologist at the Yerkes Primate Research Center in Atlanta, picking a fight can actually be a way for male chimps to relate to one another check each other out, and take a first step toward friendship. Female chimps rarely fight, but when they do, their friendship is over. The hostility that results can last for years. Serious injury is also more likely to occur when female chimpanzees fight. Female chimps who have fought one another are vindictive and irreconcilable, according to Dr. DeWall. In our species, these differences are apparent as soon as children can talk. Boys as young as two years of age, given a choice between violent fairy tales and warm and fuzzy fairy tales, usually choose the violent stories. Girls as young as two years of age consistently choose the warm and fuzzy stories. In another study, psychologists found that five- and seven-year-old girls who prefer violent stories are more likely to have significant behavior problems than girls who prefer warm, nurturing stories. However, among boys, preference for violent stories is not an indicator of underlying psychiatric problems. A preference for violent stories seems to be normal for 5- to 7-year-old boys, while the same preference in 5- to 7-year-old girls suggests a psychiatric disorder. Psychologists Louise and David Perry interviewed girls and boys, average age 10 years, asking them how they might respond to certain situations. For example, they ask the children, suppose you're playing soccer with your friends and some other kid comes and grabs the ball from you. Would you hit the other kid? If you did hit the other kid, do you think hitting the kid would get you the ball back? And how would you feel afterward? Most boys said that they would hit the kid who tried to steal the ball. The older the boy, the more confident he was that he would succeed in getting the ball back by hitting the other kid and the boys who said that they would hit the other kid also said that they would feel absolutely no guilt about hitting him. Why should I feel guilty? He took my ball. They were confident that other boys would approve of their action. For good reason. Boys who act aggressively usually raise their standing in the eyes of other boys, as long as their action is provoked, that is, as long as it's not bullying. Girls respond differently. Not only were girls less likely to respond aggressively to the kid who stole the soccer ball, they were also more likely to have misgivings about responding aggressively and less confident of a successful outcome. They were more likely to anticipate feelings of guilt and emotional upset about hitting someone else, even in response to the provocation of someone taking away their soccer ball. And they did not expect other girls to approve of their action, even though it was provoked. Girls who act aggressively may lower their standing in the eyes of their peers. There is good evidence that at least some of these differences are biologically programmed. Some of that evidence comes from studies of girls with congenital adrenal hyperplasia, CAH. Owing to a genetic defect in the adrenal glands, the adrenal tissues of girls with CAH produce high levels of male hormone, 
while the girl is still in her mother's womb. That male hormone partially masculinizes the girl's brain. When young girls who have CAH are offered a toy, given the choice of an airplane, a ball, military action figures, Barbie and Ken dolls, or magic markers, CAH girls are more likely to choose an airplane or a ball, or the fighting action figures, and less likely to choose the Barbie and Ken dolls or magic markers, compared with normal girls. When CAH girls are tested at age 4, they are found to have story preferences about halfway between those of normal girls and normal boys. CAH girls are more likely to choose violent stories than normal girls are, but less likely to choose violent stories than normal boys are. In fact, the masculinity of a CAH girl's choice of toy is directly proportional to the severity of that girl's CAH. The more severe her CAH, that is, the more male hormone her brain was exposed to before birth, the more masculine her behavior and her toy preferences will be. These researchers also found no evidence of parental influence on their child's play behavior. Parents who encouraged their daughters to play with more feminine toys had zero effect on their child's play behavior. Studies with laboratory animals show the same pattern. Among most higher mammals, and especially among our closest relatives, the primates, juvenile males are more likely to engage in rough-and-tumble play than females are. In one study of long-tailed macaques, for example, the boy monkeys were six times more likely to engage in rough-and-tumble play than the girl monkeys were. Girl monkeys, on the other hand, are more likely to engage in what primatologists call all-apparenting, their babysitting. Young female monkeys are far more likely than young males to look after a baby monkey, allowing the baby's mother time off to forage. The mother returns to retrieve the baby from the babysitter when it's time for the baby to breastfeed. Wherever you look among the primates, you'll find that young females show much more interest than young males do in taking care of babies. That's certainly true for baboons, rhesus monkeys, marmosets, and vervet monkeys. It's also true for humans. Girls, on average, are much more likely to embrace little babies and be interested in babies than boys are. That sex difference is not affected by parents' attitudes toward their child's behavior. Sons whose parents encourage them to nurture babies are no more nurturing than sons of parents who make no such efforts. One essential premise of evolutionary biology is that if you find a behavior that is conserved across many different species within an order, in this case the primate order, then that behavior probably serves some biologically useful purpose. It's not hard to see a biologically useful purpose for young female primates to feel drawn to caring for little babies. Formal studies have demonstrated that the more practice a young female monkey has taking care of a little baby, the better she will be at doing it. But what about rough-and-tumble play? What evolutionary purpose is served when young males chase each other and wrestle, sometimes for hours on end? Primatologists have suggested two reasons why young males, and not young females, spend so much time engaged in rough-and-tumble play. One reason is that in many primate species, including our closest relative, the chimpanzee, the male is much more likely to pursue and kill moderate-sized prey. The adult male chimpanzee commonly hunts, kills, and eats medium-sized animals, such as monkeys, while the adult female chimpanzee very rarely hunts such prey, instead preferring nuts, berries, and invertebrate species such as termites. Adolescent male chimpanzees often kill monkeys. Adolescent female chimpanzees never do. If males and females eat differently, then they may benefit from different activities in childhood. If you are going to be chasing and killing monkeys for your supper, then you can use all the practice you can get chasing and wrestling. But there's another reason, primatologists say, why it's useful for young males to engage in play fighting. Wrestling and fighting with other males teaches them the rules of the game. If young male primates are deprived of the opportunity to fight with other males, those males grow up to be more violent as adults, not less. They've never learned how to get along with other males in a playful, aggressive way. The rage seems to get bottled up inside until it explodes. And if it's true for our cousins, it may be true for us. 
In just a moment, we'll discuss proposals offered by well-intentioned reformers to ban dodgeball and even snowball throwing on the grounds that such activities are violent and aggressive. The irony is that if our sons are anything like their primate cousins, such measures may not decrease the likelihood of serious violent acts. Indeed, it may increase the likelihood of exactly the kind of violent outburst the reformers are trying to prevent. Girls and boys fight differently. Boys can be mean to one another, but the meanness is usually right there on the surface. Riley puts a wad of sticky used chewing gum on Mike's seat at the cafeteria table when Mike isn't looking. Mike sits down, realizes he's got somebody else's chewing gum on his butt, and looks around to see who did it. Somebody points at Riley. Mike hauls off and slugs him. The two boys roll on the floor, hitting and kicking until Mike pins Riley down. The teachers pull them apart and send both of them to the principal's office. One day later, Mike and Riley may be sitting together at lunch, better friends than they were before. Provocation leading to a violent response followed by resolution. That's the pattern with many boys. But that simple pattern is rare among girls. The surface of a girl fight can be silent and smooth as a marble, observes Rachel Simmons. Tension can arise so subtly that even the girls themselves sometimes can't honestly tell you how it started. A violent response is seldom appropriate and seldom made, because the provocation may be hard to define. She ignored me in the hall, even after I said hello to her. She sat with Karen instead of me at lunch, and she knows Karen hates me. She sighed when I spoke up in English class, like I had said something stupid. Tensions can simmer and build for weeks or months, corroding a friendship until there is no friendship left. Simmons uses the phrase alternative aggression to describe these ongoing wars among adolescent girls. It's a useful term because it reminds us that these ongoing tensions are a form of aggression. Parents sometimes don't recognize the damage that alternative aggression can cause. For one thing, the perpetrator is often a good girl, polite to adults and clever at hiding her traces. A girl who victimizes other girls in this manner is often the most socially skilled, and may even be one of the most popular girls, just the opposite of the typical boy bully. Girl bullies are different from boy bullies. Boys who bully are often pathetic characters themselves. The male bully may have few friends, may be socially inept, may not be doing well in school. He picks on his victim as a way of improving his own status, at least in his own eyes. I can't be the most contemptible person in the school if Tyler is terrified of me, he thinks. But he probably doesn't know Tyler very well. His bullying is motivated not so much by anything Tyler has done or said, but by his own insecurities, his vague hope that he will feel better by making someone else miserable. He may also hope to ingratiate himself with other boys by picking on the victim. When an unpopular kid is harassed by someone from a popular crowd, Wannabes and posers may take the incident as a signal that their own status can be improved by going after that victim, observes Professor John Bishop of Cornell University. The situation is almost completely reversed for girls. Whereas boys typically bully kids they barely know, girls almost always bully girls within their social group. These girls are intimate enemies. They know each other. They know where it hurts most. Here's a summary. Girls who bully typically have many friends, are socially skilled, act in groups to isolate a single girl, are doing well in school, know the girls they are bullying. Boys who bully typically have few friends, are socially inept, act alone, are doing poorly in school, don't know the boys or girls they bully. So perhaps critical thinking with a little education. Oh. Uh, I, I am. Uh, uh, I will settle for almost any kind of thing. <laughs> it's so rare these days. Well, first of all, if you don't have a purpose, then, sir, it isn't that your life becomes neutral in a, in a meaningless sense. It's that your life becomes characterized by unbearable suffering. Because the baseline condition of life is something like unbearable suffering. <laughs>